It would be an understatement to say that this upcoming election, just a few days away, is one of, if not the most important election in our lifetimes, for sure it is. And today I have a guest I've been trying to get on the program, an amazing guest, to show you just how important it is. I'm Drenda, and this is Drenda On Guard. Let's get into it. We must stand up. There are answers, and we've got to expose the darkness in the world so that we can be free. Self-made gods are nice things to have around until people actually start to need God. And that's what's happening in our culture. We need to do something. We need to say something. We need to stand up, be bold and courageous. You've got to stay on guard. I have wanted to have this guest from the very beginning of Drenda On Guard, and she is an amazing woman of God. She has stood up for her faith, her family, but also for our government and children. Congresswoman Michelle Bachman was the first woman to be in the Congress in Minnesota, and she is an amazing lady. She served on the advisory council for President Trump, and she was active in politics in all different areas, speaking up, especially for children, for families, and helping to bring truth to our government. I'm so delighted to welcome today to Drend on Guard, Michelle Bachman. Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, thank you for joining us today. Drenda, thank you so much. What a thrill to be with you and your terrific audience today. Thank you. You have so much insight. And I also want to thank you for the endorsement that you gave me for Fight Like Heaven. And uh, thank you. So I was so honored that you did that. And it's been a joy to serve with you at America Stands and watch you work. You are amazing when you get in there and you're looking at the districts and you're able to call the numbers. And I recall uh, the 2016 election, you were able to call Florida uh, and that night of the election before any of the networks did. And you were able to tell us that Donald Trump had won the presidency before any of the networks. So thank you so much for that. Amen. And we're going to have so much fun again on the Victory Channel on election night. There's literally nowhere else that I'd want to be watching election results other than the Victory Channel, because it is done in a spirit of faith and it's done from a biblical perspective. And I think people are just going to love it. And we have excellent people who are going to be on that evening. And so people won't want to miss it. That's right. That's right. Join us on that. So I want to get into the issues. Let's talk about what's going on and the impact people can have. You've made tremendous impact. You know, one thing I should tell you that I, I'm, I'm excited about, and I still haven't really fully comprehended it, today is the 50th anniversary of accepting Christ into my life. And I knew that this day was coming, but I mean, it, it really is something to think of 50 years ago today, making that commitment to Christ. And I look at, you know, the it, I was 16 and I look at the first 16 years of my life. And then I look at, you know, how the Lord takes all of that brokenness and then what he does, what he's done for 50 years. It's, it really is breathtaking. So I, I wrote to my family because I'm here in Virginia beach and my family is not. And so I wrote to them, we're on a family thread, a text message. And I wrote to them last night and gave them all my testimony and said, this is the most important thing that ever happened in my life. The most important decision ever in my life. And I, you know, here is salvation. I want to make sure that everyone knows this and that everyone is going to be on the other side because the choices start, it, eternity comes to us all, but it's two different places. It's heaven and it's hell and it's real. And everyone has to make that decision. And so, you know, our family, they've all, you know, they've heard the salvation story forever, but, you know, you've got in-laws and you've got, you know, a lot of different people. And I never presume, I never presume. And so I'm just struck by how profound it is when we come to the Lord, how it impacts this life, but even more important, how it impacts eternity and what that's going to mean for every person, the impact of eternity and just how stark that is, that it is going to be one direction or it's going to be another. There is no do over. That's and right. um, it's a it's a profound thought to me. It is. There's only two kingdoms. And that's that's what, right. One of the things I wanted to make clear in the book, you know, you're either. We don't talk, to, we don't talk about that anymore. That's right. We don't talk about that, but we need to. 
because that's we just true. presume everybody gets a good day, you know, mm-hmm. and that's not the way it is. That's right. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. You're either gathering with me or you're scattering. And so it's pretty clear that that's, it's one or the other. And I think that's, that's getting clearer and clearer. Uh, you know, we could have said there was gray area, but there really never was any gray area. But because things have become so clearly one side or the other, it is even clearer than ever that we have to make a decision and we're calling everybody else to make decisions that you're either for him or against him. And I think that is part of what's going on. There's a shifting and shaking and people are having to make their decision, whether they're going to please people, whether they're going to uh, go with the agendas of the day and what's popular and uh, the enemy's plans and the antichrist spirit that's operating or whether they're going to stand with Christ stand with God's word, stand with the truth. And it all plays out with political implications in government and in every sphere of influence in life, everyone's having to make decisions. We see it in the medical, we see it uh, in education, we see it in church pulpits. It's surprising to me how many ministers are not talking about some of these issues and have taken stands with tolerance. So anyway, I really appreciate that you've always stood for your faith. A lot of people probably don't even know your background or history, how you got you're, you know, Congresswoman, two terms, but how did you even get involved in that to begin with? How did I get involved in it? it that's a good question. Actually, I, I wasn't overtly political. I wasn't looking to be political, but it was our foster children. We had five biological children, and then we brought foster children into our home. We became licensed foster parents. We had 23 great uh, teenage girls live in our home over the years, and I I distinctly remember one day, one of our foster daughters brought home her math assignment and it was for 11th grade. It was supposed to be algebra class. And all it was, was a poster to color. And I looked at that and I thought, I don't ever remember an algebra class where you colored. You know, I would be, I would get on the kitchen floor with my three-year-old and color pictures with her but not an 11th grader. And in a moment, the whole problem crystallized for me. And I thought this, if anyone needs a leg up, a foster child does. And it broke my heart because I thought that this was such a dumb down exercise. She would never get the proper education that she needed to get a decent job or to get further education if this was the level of education she was getting. And then I also saw My husband and I were employers. We owned a private Christian counseling agency. And I knew that the next generation of people that we'd have to hire, if this is the level of education they're getting, we're not going to be able to hire decent employees. So I saw it from both aspects, how this was going to affect the United States. And I got really just a, an insight into how poor the education system was. And we, I was from Minnesota. Minnesota year over year produced the students who always ranked number one on SAT scores and ACT scores. So we were very high performing in terms of education. And yet this was the very low quality work that I saw coming home in the backpack. And so God put a godly calling on my life. And I was home full time with these children, but I had been a federal tax litigation attorney. And then I gave that up to be a full time mother. And so God put this calling on my heart. And so I began researching and Drenda, I spent over 2000 hours researching what went wrong with America's education system. Used to be very good. And then I saw the progression. And from that research, I asked our pastor if I could do a presentation at church and I did. And from that, I went into this four or five years on uh, trying to bring excellence back into America's education system. And from that, then I was drafted to run for the Minnesota State Senate. And then from there, I was drafted to run for the United States Congress. And that was my entry into politics. It was really through trying to reform and get a decent education system back into the United States because that was the foundation. And what I learned is that we had a grand theft larceny. We had a top flight education system based upon knowledge, facts, and information stolen out from under all 50 states. And instead, what it was replaced with was an indoctrination program of attitudes, values, and beliefs that were not in any way reflective of America's history, nor the viewpoint of moms and dads. 
So now here we are 25 years later, looking at these wars in states like Virginia and states all across the country where parents are saying, what's happened to my child's classroom? Well, this happened decades ago in our, in our children's classrooms. Only now today, it is so egregious that we no longer recognize the nation we live in. So that's what got me involved. It was really being foster parents and being heartbroken over what I saw happen to the public school system. Our biological children were homeschooled and sent to private Christian schools. But in the state of Minnesota, foster children only have one choice, the public schools. And that's what I came face to face with. And that's really the beginning of this journey in politics. Mm. And you decide, I'm going to get involved and change the laws. I'm going to make legislation that protects children and especially foster children. I remember you telling me uh, in the past when we've spoken of all children that needed that extra help, you wanted to put them in a private school. You want to help them with an extra hand up. You weren't allowed to put them in private school, Christian school. You weren't allowed to home educate them. So you got involved in politics and you made such a big difference. And now as a regent, uh, the dean at the Regent University uh, you're over the government area and you're training uh, young people and uh, helping them understand what you've learned over all these years of being involved in politics, government. Tell me, Michelle, what do you think as far as this election? Is this one of the most important elections that we've seen? And how how is this all playing out? What do we need to do to be involved? Everyone needs to vote. And if you yes. can still register to vote, you need to register to vote and actually get out and vote and get as many people to the polls as you can because all politics is local. What happens in your town, what happens in your school board, what happens in your state legislature is of supreme importance as well as at the national level. But we have got to get out. And this is what people don't understand, Dorenda. Just one church, just the congregation of one church can completely change an election in your local area. You can completely dominate a school board race, or you can dominate your city council or your mayoral or your county board elections if just your church is informed. And if people would just do a tiny bit of research and figure out who are the candidates that represent biblical values, godly values? And if you can find that out for the school board and then let everyone in your congregation that you know or your circle of friends know, um, you can have a profound impact on that race or your city council or who your local state legislature is. I have an agreement with another girlfriend at home uh, in my home state of Minnesota, and we do that. We research, we find out who these people are, and then we make sure everyone knows. If you're a trusted source, if you have some credibility in your church or in your circle, then you can share with a group of people who you would recommend for other people to vote for. This is probably the most important midterm election in modern times. We have a presidential election two years from now, but as we know, the United States of America has fallen so far, so fast in less than two years time on almost every metric. Uh, when Donald Trump left office, the United States was performed, performing at a very high rate of uh, productivity. And that's despite um, a, a year or so of COVID and all of the impact that that had on our economy and also quite frankly on foreign policy. But what we have seen under President Joe Biden is devastating. We saw the United States in effect lose its superpower military status by the greatest military defeat in Afghanistan where about $84 billion worth of military hardware, the finest, most up-to-date hard hardware in the world was left on the battlefield in Afghanistan. If you look at Joe Biden today, everyone sees a weak individual, certainly not able to perform as the leader of the free world. And he is not performing as that leader. Someone is pulling the strings, but it's not him. That isn't lost just on the American people. Foreign leaders all across the world see the weakness in the United States. They see the decisions that are being made that are political, politically suicidal to a strong United States economy and to a strong United States military. The other leaders have taken the assessment of where the United States is at and they've made decisions accordingly. And that's why you see such utter turmoil all across the world right now. 
You see the communist Chinese on the march across the world. They're gobbling up every nation that they possibly can uh, through, through a lot of um, extraordinary means. And you see here in the United States domestically, lawlessness is the rule of the day here in the United States with out of control crime where people don't even feel comfortable leaving their homes or going to a shopping center to shop because they have to look around to make sure someone isn't going to carjack them. We have never been in this kind of situation before where you see the Federal Reserve increase interest rates almost every other week. The Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates another three quarter of a point to the point where people don't even feel like they can buy a home anymore or sell a home anymore. I mean, it is profound what is happening. And that's just for people who are paying attention, for, for people who aren't paying attention to politics because they could care less about politics, they innately know that something is very seriously wrong because they go to the grocery store and they cannot even put the food in their carts anymore that they used to put in. It's really frightening, it's scary, it is, um, I've had retirees say to me, they have to go back and get another job or they can't leave their job, they have to keep working. America's changed overnight. With this midterm election, Drenda, if people go out and vote and they recognize that Washington DC is run by one political party, the Democrat party, and almost every large major city in the United States is run by one party, the Democrat Party. So if you look at all the problems that are happening, there is one political party that's holding the bag on this. And I'm not trying to be partisan. I'm just saying, look at the results. Right. Look at the results of what's happened. And so we need a change. And this is what people need to remember, Drenda. There will be no change if we don't change who's sitting in office. And yes. so we have got to get out We've got to vote biblical values, but we need to recognize quite literally our future is at stake right now because the future is ugly. If we're not going to, um, if we're not going to access the energy resources that are abundant here in the United States, when Donald Trump was the president of the United States, we were providing 100% of all of our energy needs. Gasoline was $1.89 a gallon. Well, what changed? The only thing that changed is the guy sitting in the White House. And the very right. first thing that President Biden did is shut down American energy production. Well, look what that's look what that's meant. So this is extremely important. It's been reported that we only have 25 days supply of diesel fuel in the United States. I mean, don't get me started. We have got to have a change in this midterm if we do not. It's like the game of hockey. With hockey, the goaltender is one of the most important spots. And so if the House and Senate can change so that it's no longer run by Democrats, if it's run by Republicans, then at least the House and the Senate in Congress can be the goaltenders and they can stop these insane moves by the White House under President Biden from happening and we can try to reverse course and try to get our country back in order again in anticipation of the 2024 uh, presidential cycle. So we have got to do something. We can't sit on our hands. And to me, this is an act of worship before the Lord. Politics is a part of creation. It's part of what God has created, those who are in authority over us. And so we need to take this action very seriously as believers. We have a duty to fellow believers and to fellow non-believers to love them, to love them by taking action that would help bring about a magnificent society. And it's not loving when you have drag queen story hour in your local kindergarten or in your local public library. That isn't love. That's gross. That's, that's a, that is defilement against little children. I mean, yes. can you believe, Drenda, we are in a day and time where genital mutilation of little children is being pushed in K-12 schools. We're not it's making shocking. this up. This no, is actually shocking. happening in K-12 schools. So what are we as believers going to do? If you look at the Good Samaritan who saw a, 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 um, someone just laying on the side of the road who'd been beat up by bandits and stolen from, 
That's America's public schools today. Our little mm. children are getting abused in public schools today. Yes. And so we've got to take that responsibility. We've got to save these innocent children and their, their lives and these families. We've got to show up at the polls and get decent school board members in, decent mayors in, and certainly vote in these state legislatures and at the federal level. And if you don't know who to vote for, um, you can go to your, uh, your, your state may have a family council. It may have an organization that has voter guides. And then you check with them or call your local church and find out where can you get a voter guide so you can find out who is going to stand up for biblical values. And then someone in your church should be the designee and then just make sure that everyone is aware of this information and get out and vote. If we sit this out, shame on us. Yes, absolutely. What do you see happening if we don't flip at least the House and hopefully we can flip the House and the Senate? What are some of the key races and what do you see happening if we don't uh, get in there and vote and change this? If we won't get in there and change this, I foresee that we're looking toward a future where literally we could use, lose cash in the United States. We could lose our currency in the United States. We could be going into the federal government through a centralized bank um, doing away with cash and instead we have digital money and then the government would program the money. I know this sounds bizarre. Oh, it's it's happening already in China. Yes, that's right. It's happened in China, but I think our government will turn into more of a surveillance state and they'll want to put us into a social credit system like China. And we can only then sell, use our money on what the government tells us we can spend our money on. I mean, you're, you're right. thinking to yourself, Michelle Bachman, you're an absolute kook. <laughs> But this, these kooky things are already happening. They're already being discussed by yes, our leaders are. in Washington, D.C. And so we've got to stop this. We've got to stop this now. We've got to stop our military from turning into a social science experiment and um, demand that our military be used to stop, to, to fight wars and keep the United States safe. If people only had any idea how far gone this administration is. We have got to stop this. And we can stop this if we have a Congress that provides oversight over what the White House is doing. Today, with Democrats running the Senate and running the House, Drenda, there is zero oversight, zero oversight. And so we need a new House and a new Senate to check the lawlessness that is coming out of the White House and, frankly, out of the Congress right now. We have to stop the lawlessness and that won't happen if we have a Democrat House and a Democrat Senate, and we've got to change that. So the races that are important, it's literally, it's virtually every single state, but the United States senators have to be changed. And I would say, look at their records, but I, I know of no Republican that's running for Senate today that I wouldn't vote for. I may not agree with them on everything, but there isn't one that I wouldn't vote for because yes. Chuck Schumer isn't putting a check in any way on Joe Biden and neither is Nancy Pelosi in the house. So we have, we have got to get out, we've got to vote and we've got to stop this utter lawlessness from happening. Amen, I agree 150%. Uh, what would you say to that person that says, well, last time the election, you know, there wasn't integrity, there wasn't this or that. I don't know if my vote that makes a difference. What would you say to them? Because you know, there are those folks that say, well, I'm not going to bother. What do you say? I mean, you've just told us all these things that are at stake, but what would you well, say to them? It would, it, it, to me, it would be the uh, most incomprehensible act for a person not to vote. It, mm -hmm. it would just be incomprehensible because then it would be essentially saying, I'm going to allow the lawless to have their way. I'm going to allow those who want to abuse little children in our school system to have their way. I'm going to allow those who want to defund the police to have their way. I'm going to allow carjacking to continue in our cities. I'm going to allow gangs to run wild in our cities. I'm going to allow an open border on our Southern border. Who does that? Certainly not believers, I would yeah. hope. That's not a biblical response. A biblical response is to know what God says about these issues in his word 
as faithful pastors have been preaching across our nation, we don't just take our marbles and go home and say, well, I give up. I guess the bad guys are going to win. Thank God that didn't happen, Dorenda, in the pro-life movement. For 50 yes. years, we prayed, we worked, we took action, we voted for pro-life candidates. Look what happened. Because yes. we voted for a pro-life president in 2016, and Donald Trump became president of the United States. He appointed good constitutional judges to the Supreme Court. And Roe versus Wade was overturned after 50 years, it was overturned. Do you know that just in the amount of time that the Dobbs decision has been passed, over 10,000 fewer babies mm. have been aborted just because of that. That's a huge victory for yes. life that we see. And so that's because believers stayed in the game. And so that's why believers need to get out and we need to vote. And there is no use for people saying my vote doesn't count. You have no idea how many times, and I know that people, it's hard for people to believe. You have no idea how many times an election has been decided literally by one vote. During the last week, I heard about a school board race in Iowa. And so a farmer was going to run for school board and that farmer on that day, he got busy and he didn't even go vote for himself. Do you know that he lost the race because not one person even voted for the school board in that town? Not even one. So if he would have made it to the poll, he was a godly man, he would have won in that school wow. board race. So mm -hmm. it happens everywhere across the country. So I know that uh, shenanigans can happen in these races, but if we show up and if we vote, they have to steal an awful lot more than our That's vote. Good. I voted last week. I voted by my absentee ballot because I'm in the state of Virginia. I'm voting in Minnesota. So I made sure I knew who all the people were to vote for down the ballot. I got it in. And I'm so thankful that I did. This is part of an act of worship as far as I'm concerned to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to be faithful, responsible, and respectful in the votes that I cast in this election. That's our gift in America that we yes. get to vote. It is. It is. I know you're a woman of prayer. And I always tell our viewers, make sure you pray and pray fervently, but also act. God will give you actions to take prayer alone. Can't get it done but we don't want to just act in ourselves. So I know you had a, a group of people meeting in Washington, D.C., praying every week when you were up there. Tell me how important prayer is and how we should be praying in this election. Jordan, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought it up. Um, here at Regent University, we are very committed to the power of prayer. M uh, maybe your audience doesn't know about Regent University. We're in Virginia Beach, Virginia. It was begun by Pat Robertson. So some of your viewers may know Pat Robertson and the 700 Club. This university was started to the glory of God 44 years ago. And uh, we believe very strongly in the power of prayer. This is the second year from the School of Government that we have sponsored 40 days of prayer and fasting. And we did that this year. We began last year with maybe 12 people. We grew it to about 90 some. This year we started and we grew it to over 300 and some. And so every day for 30 minutes, we met on Zoom, we fasted, we prayed. We prayed for these American elections. We prayed for the elections in Brazil. We're praying today is an election in Israel. And we are praying for these elections. We believe in what the book of Daniel says, that it is the most high God who lifts up who he will and who takes down who he will. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And we pray according to scripture. Just yesterday, I had a student here in my office and we were praying Psalm 75, verse 10. And it is that God would break the wicked and that he would empower the godly. And so we are asking God to bring down the wicked who are in positions of power here in the United States, in Israel, in various nations, but also that he would empower the godly because we uh, because the bible says when the righteous rule the people rejoice but when the wicked rule the people mourn 
And so the scripture is filled with advice about elections, about governance, and we need to be about our father's business. And that includes the power of prayer to trust our heavenly father, that he loves us so much. He has not abandoned us and he will hear us when we cry out to him on behalf of our nation. Yes, he will. I'm just like you to pray. Would you be willing to do that? Let's just pray for this election. Amen. Yeah. Father, I thank you for this election. I thank you for Drenda. I thank you for this audience. Lord, I thank you that this is an audience that knows you and honors you. Father, we lift this nation up to you and we know that this nation has turned its back on you. And so Lord, we stand as proxies, confessing the sins of this nation and turning away from the sins of this nation. And instead, oh God, we turn to you. We think of righteous Lot, Father, and Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lord, uh, we think of Abraham who cried out to, to you, O oh Father, to spare destroying the city for the sake of even 10 righteous. Lord, we look out at the United States of America. Clearly, there are more than 10 righteous here. Father, we ask you for this nation. I ask you specifically for the children of this nation yes. who don't deserve mm -hmm. what's coming to them from, from demonic forces and from demonic adults who are trying to impose upon them, Father, preparations for bringing these children into perversions for, for their own perverse purposes. So, Father, I cry out to you for this nation, if nothing else, for the sake of innocent children, mm -hmm. asking that you would preserve their innocence and keep them from the realm of the demonic in this nation. So, God, hear us mm -hmm. in repentance. Hear yes. us in confession of sin. And hear us, oh God, if nothing more, for the sake of the children of this nation, yes, God. Lord, would you remove the wicked from positions of authority? And instead, yes. oh God, would you empower the godly to take yes. up these positions so that our nation would come into alignment mm -hmm. with your, your, your word? We know mm -hmm. you, we, we haven't always done right by you, Lord, but forgive us of our sins, Father. And give us yet a little bit more time here in this nation by granting us godly positions to people to take up these positions of authority in our nation. We ask all these things, Father, in unity, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow. I feel God's presence on that. Thank you. I uh, am looking forward to being with you on election night at America Stands at the Victory Channel. And uh, if folks want to check that out, go victory.com. We'll be on that evening. And I so enjoyed being with you the last election and you calling and telling us what was going on in the districts, uh, both on the 2016, the 2020, and this again this uh, time. So I'm so grateful for what you're doing, the voice of righteousness. Uh, you woke me up many years ago when you were sharing what was happening at the time, uh, the Obama administration uh, filling our government ranks with people that did not have American ideology, uh, our airports, our airport security across the land. And, you know, I really appreciate it. I watched you, watched your journey as you uh, fought the fight and as you were persecuted for righteousness, but you stood with strong and you kept uh, sharing the truth and you still are. And I'm so, so grateful for that. It's women like you that encourage the rest of us to step up. And that's what my goal here is as well. And so thank you so much for what you do. And thank you for what you're doing at Regent University. And it's a great place to raise up future leaders. And so thank you so much. God bless you. And happy 50 years of serving Jesus, Michelle. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today. And, uh, you know, we are in a battle. There is a war going on. And through faith and patience, we inherit the promises of God. So I encourage you to stay on guard. We'll see you next time. There are a lot of Christians who would tell you, a lot of leaders, a lot of pastors that would tell you, don't talk about certain things. In many ways, the church at large has been outwitted by Satan. 
We don't want to be silent about these things. We want to speak up. It takes courage. It takes boldness. But if we don't address and expose the deeds of darkness, then they take over. We must counter it. We must yep. know our enemy. We must know our adversary. And we must know what his tactics are. We cannot be complacent anymore. You have influence. God has placed you in a sphere of influence. You are a soldier of the light. We need to be straightforward with the truth. Help us to be strong, God. Help us to do our part, Father, to be disciplined, to be ready, to be soldiers of light, soldiers of truth. God, help us to be on guard.